Hello, lovely internet strangers. In today's episode of The Eighth Square's Corner, I'm going to be discussing an annoying article. I feel like it's been a hot minute since I've addressed annoying feminist articles. This one doesn't really merit some well thought out scripted video. I just want to talk about this article and why it annoys me. So here we go. This article is from USA Today. Girls Who Code CEO, How a Typo Can Be a Radical Act of feminism. Yes, please tell us, Girls Who Code CEO, how can a typo be a radical act of feminism? This is going to be the most important thing I learn all day. So the article is either written by her or written in her voice by a ghostwriter. Last fall, I was sitting in a room with about a dozen women. We all came from different generations, careers, ethnic backgrounds, zip codes, financial circumstances. That we all identified as women was really our only common denominator. Not that they were women, that they identified as women. Let's note the language, guys. Oh no, I said guys. Someone get the cane, pull me off stage, lock me up. So offensive. That we all identified as women was really our only common denominator. That is, until I challenged each of them to send an email to a colleague with a typo in it on purpose. <gasps> you could feel the room tense up. A few of them visibly cringed. Everyone was clearly discomfited by the idea. On the surface, this might sound like a trivial detail. You don't say. But to women driven by perfection, in other words, 99% of us, a typo in a professional email is tantamount to sinking one's career. It tells the receiver you aren't to be taken seriously, aren't worthy of their respect. If you got this wrong, what else might you be getting wrong? How many times that week had these women read and reread their emails, screening for mistakes and scrutinizing whether they hit the ideal tone probably a couple hundred times each? They're not alone. For a few years now, starting with when I founded Girls Who Code, I've been studying the perils of perfection for women. I've been thinking about how it gets in the way of our success, our well-being, our lives, and how we might be able to reverse the damage done. And she's written a book because that's the next thing in this article is an image of the cover of her book called brave, not perfect. And at the top it says, fear less, fail more, and live bolder. Anyway, she doesn't say, and I've written a book about it. That was just me adding that in. As it turns out, perfectionism is a trap set uniquely for women. Uniquely for women. Let's talk about the typo thing. I worked in publishing, as many of you watching this channel will know, and there are definitely certain industries where making a typo does say something about you, and publishing was definitely one of them. But it wasn't just me as a woman who agonized over this. It was definitely a thing that the men in that industry did too. I won't say like we're all sitting there rereading every email 10 times like, oh my god, did I forget a comma? But it definitely hit you pretty hard if you had a typo because if you work in publishing, you're always trying to project this image of I know how to write properly and edit my own work, even my emails. But if you're sitting there agonizing over your emails to the point that it's interfering with your work, then do some kind of inner self-work journaling, whatever you need to do. I should say that I am someone who is a perfectionist, who struggles with perfectionism and the associated procrastination, the associated anxiety problems I have for as long as I can remember being a person. So everything that I am saying about this article comes from being one of the women that she is supposedly talking about. Like I have written a blog post about this for a blog that I have where I talk about mental health and productivity and wellness and stuff like that. It's something I've given a lot of thought. It's something that has been a real issue for me in my life. So I'm not discounting the idea that perfectionism and anxiety and procrastination is an issue issue, but it's not necessarily an issue for all women. It can also be an issue for men. It does seem like it's more common that it crops up in women, but let's also remember that she's not dealing with a random sample of women. She's dealing with women who have put themselves in incredibly stressful environments that are not really suited to the feminine way, shall we say. The masculine is more about going out and taking. The feminine is 
often more about like receiving and waiting and maybe working in a flow is actually what I would say. There are a lot of women who talk about women's reproductive health nowadays that are really opposed to the birth control pill. And they talk about how women have these, you know, natural hormonal cycles that influence how you should be in the world. That the feminine way is you shouldn't just be having the same schedule day in and day out for an entire month, for an entire year. You should structure what you do in terms of exercise, socializing, and productive work based on your hormonal levels because they affect your cognition and your energy levels. So women would probably do better in an environment where they can be more flexible, where they can be more adaptive, and not like really high stress environments that require you to show up day in, day out, produce, 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 and you're in constant competition. Like the women that this CEO is dealing with, I assume that all these women are women who are trying to live the corporate life or they want to be entrepreneurs or they want to be programmers, whatever, because she's a CEO of Girls Who Code. So, you know, probably women who want to do something with tech. Do housewives have this perfectionist problem the way she's talking about it? Like, does a housewife freak out if she forgot to give someone a fork when she set the table? Like, what would be the housewife equivalent, you know? I mean, I'm sure there have always been women that take a certain perfectionistic view of their household and it has to be super clean. But there's also a difference between having high standards and being a perfectionist because being a perfectionist means that you internalize it like the perfection is a part of your identity. It's a reflection on you. So if things aren't perfect, it means that you're bad and you're a failure versus a housewife who just likes to have their house in perfect order because it makes them happy or it makes them feel more comfortable, whatever. They get a satisfaction out of making it that way. So I can go with her on the idea that perfectionism is something that is more common in women. Okay. But what we definitely disagree about is the cause of this perfectionism and what can be done about it. Because she says that the trap is set for young women from a young age. So she's going to start talking about the social constructionist view of how women are. Because, you know, the way that we raise our daughters makes them this way. And I'm always like, who's we? You know? She continues, as it turns out, perfectionism is a trap set uniquely for women. And it's set from the time we're very young. In an experiment run by ABC News with the help of psychologist Campbell Leeper from the University of California, boys and girls were given salty glasses of lemonade. The lemonade was meant to taste awful. The whole point of the experiment was to see how the boys reacted and how the girls reacted. The boys immediately said, yuck, this tastes disgusting. All the girls, however, politely drank it and even choked it down. Only when the researchers pushed and asked the girls why they hadn't told them the lemonade was terrible, did the girls admit that they hadn't wanted to make the researchers feel bad. I looked into the actual experiment, so we're going to come back to that and uh, discredit a little bit of the way she's painting that research. The need to please, the need to be perfect, only gets worse as we get older. It's not a coincidence that girls in my programs at Girls Who Code would rather show their teachers an empty screen than reveal a line of code that's potentially incorrect. It's not just a fluke that, according to a study by Harvard professor Claudia Golden, women who earn Bs in introductory economics are far more likely to switch majors than those who earn A while their male counterparts stick with it. Bees be damned. Yeah, I think that's definitely true of women. But again, what do you propose to do about it? She's saying that something about the way we socialize girls is going to change this. But is it? I mean, is that not just an indication that they didn't like the thing enough to deal with the setbacks? Because I feel like there are plenty of women who, when they're really passionate about something, are willing to work through all the setbacks women who are really passionate about writing novels or dance or becoming a doctor or whatever it is, they find a way to push through the critical feedback and rejections. You know, women who become actresses, they have to deal with rejection all the time, losing out on auditions constantly, but they're obviously passionate about it, so they make it work. But maybe not as many women are passionate about economics. You see similar things in STEM fields, engineering, mathematics, physics. Maybe they'd be willing to become a physics major if it was just super easy for them, but because they're not and they don't 
don't have that underlying passion and drive, you know? So either the men who stuck with economics are really passionate about economics and they're okay with getting a B, or maybe they're just not thinking about it that hard and they don't realize that maybe they should quit while they're ahead or something. I mean, a B is not that bad of a grade. If it was like a C or a D, it'd be different. But this is a plot line in Gilmore Girls. Rory has said forever she wants to be a journalist, blah, blah, blah. But the first time someone tells her, I don't think you have what it takes to make it in journalism, she totally crumbles, has an existential crisis. I can't do it. I have to change my career. And it's like, okay, then this person was right. Because if that's how you respond to critical feedback and rejection, then you're never going to make it in the real world of journalism where people are editing your pieces and picking apart your writing and the public is reacting negatively to things that you write. I mean, come on. So I see nothing wrong with someone switching majors because they got a B if getting a B is enough to deter them, you know? And we all know of the infamous research that says women are unlikely to apply for a job unless they meet every single one of the listed qualifications while men will go for it if they hit two thirds of them. Maybe that's because women understand that they personally, maybe the men wouldn't, but they personally would feel really out of their element if they tried to do a job where there were expectations for them to know X, Y, and Z thing. And they're going to have to spend all their first few months on this job, like in their free time, learning all these skills and just constantly feeling like a failure. Maybe they recognize that would be the case and they don't really want to take a job where that would be the case. Because what's the alternative? You have these women apply for these jobs where they don't meet all the requirements. You somehow have them BS their way through the interview and then they just suffer in this job because they feel awful, like they don't know what's going on and they're not achieving anything and they're not getting any positive feedback. And then they get depressed and then they go to a therapist and talk about how the patriarchy is just keeping them down in their career when really it's the fact that they're in a job they never should have been in in the first place. Like, I think that there is something to be said for assertiveness training for women, whether it's just how you raise your daughter or things that we can do later on. But people are born a certain way and there's only so much sculpting and molding that you can do. Better to do something with your life where you're in the sweet spot of having talent and an interest in it and you're provided with some kind of challenge, but not so much of a challenge that you constantly feel out of your element. We praise our girls for being well-liked, polite, cooperative. In other words, perfect. We praise our boys for playing rough, taking apart their toys, climbing to the top of the monkey bars. In other words, brave. I definitely take issue with the idea that we praise our girls for being well-liked, polite, cooperative. In other words, perfect. But we praise our boys for playing rough, taking apart their toys, climbing to the top of the monkey bars. What mom is sitting there just like praising their boy for climbing to the top of the monkey bars? I mean, I'm not saying they don't do that, but I feel like a lot of moms approach when their kids are playing on dangerous playground equipment is to be like, be careful no matter if it's a boy or a girl. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the impression that I've gotten from my own upbringing, seeing other moms on the playgrounds, hearing stories from moms that I know. That seems to be like the default approach. It doesn't mean that all moms restrict their kids from doing anything, but I think the moms are more attuned to the danger for their children, no matter the gender of that child. And I know plenty of parents who will praise their boys for being polite and cooperative, especially because because it can be such a challenge to get them to do so. By the time our boys are teens, asking someone on a date or young adults negotiating their first raise, they are habituated to take risks. They are unfazed by failure, unobstructed by the need to be perfect. I'm sorry, but how many teenage boys are just like so confident when it's time to ask a girl out on a date? I definitely question that notion. Even for guys that are somewhat more popular, I'm sure they're not just like, this is a walk in the park. This is so easy. I'm not nervous at all, even though I think this girl is beautiful and I've like never done anything with a girl, whatever, you know? It's a thing you see constantly throughout history in media about guys having to psych themselves up to like ask her out, you know? But I thought they were unfazed by failure because their parents praised them for climbing to the top of the monkey 
monkey bars. What went wrong? Like this is something that the red pill guys are always talking about when they talk about doing day game and cold approach that you just have to do the numbers game. You have to get used to that rejection. And a lot of the red pill blogs that I read, I tend to follow the guys that I feel like are pretty honest about their stories. They'll admit that, yeah, sometimes I still punk out. Like sometimes I still see a beautiful girl and instead of approaching her, I wuss out. I don't approach because I don't want to deal with the rejection. It seems there's a direct line from straighten your dress and be careful on those monkey bars to I can't believe I sent that email with a typo and I shouldn't leave my job to start a company. It's way too risky. How many men have that same thought that they shouldn't leave their job to start a company? It's too risky. A especially married men with kids. They can't just take on a huge financial risk without seriously impacting their marriage because if it all fails, their spouse is definitely not gonna be happy with them. It's gonna affect their ability to save money for their kids' college and generally afford a decent place for their kids to live and put food on the table for them. So sure, the single men, the single young men can leave their job and start a company, but so can the single young women. They're in the same boat. But being praised for climbing the monkey bars doesn't change the financial risks and burdens that fathers have to think about before they jump ship from their comfortable job to start a business. This is not just like some female thing. Most of the people that leave their job to start their own business are men. But most men don't leave their jobs to start a business. People like this don't understand statistics and yet she is the CEO of Girls Who Code and she has a book out. Research confirms that perfectionists, completely stunted by anxiety and procrastination, are less successful in any given field. As psychologist Thomas Greenspan wisely pointed out, waiting for the surgeon to be absolutely sure the correct decision is being made could allow me to bleed to death and studies indicate that perfectionism is a stronger indicator of procrastination and anxiety for women than it is for men. When failure isn't an option, neither is taking risk risks, and that right there is how perfection strangles bravery. There are consequences of perfectionism, but those aren't the only consequences. Time and again, we've seen society instinctively bristle, or worse, lash out against a woman who takes risks, embraces failure, or even dares to wear whatever she damn pleases. That's because we are hardwired to trap women in a trope that requires them to wait their turn, hold their tongues, prove that they're likable. It's perfection or bust. That's especially true for women of color. Just consider how Serena Williams, arguably one of the greatest greatest athletes of all time, was treated at the US Open for advocating for herself, compared with how countless of her male peers were treated for doing the same, or worse. Or consider the controversy around Rashida Tlaib using impolite language. There's no overstating the amount of work to be done on the part of our institutions. We need to make sure that risks and failures and acts of bravery are equally judged, if not equally rewarded. But the shift can come from within us, too. Tell me more. Women are realizing that the more brave and authentic they are, the more successful and happier and carefree they can become. Just look at what we've seen on the national stage. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez attended a climate protest at Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office, later admitting she was so nervous that she could have thrown up. Today, her climate proposal has real traction in Congress. But how many men wouldn't be nervous going into the office of someone they admired? What does that have to do with anything? There's a strong, steady drumbeat of voices by our icons and our neighbors saying, me too, and time's up. As a result, dozens of powerful men are being held accountable for their misconduct. There's been a ton of recent literature by feminists on the subject of women's anger, pointing to moments historical and contemporary where rage fueled acts of bravery. And of course, there are the women performing small but mighty acts of bravery every day, like trying an activity or taking on a personal project they might not be great at, reminding us all to believe in the value of inviting bravery and failure into our lives. No one is suggesting that you wake up tomorrow and storm your senator's office or quit your job or start ice climbing. Being brave isn't easy. It's the everyday acts of bravery, the smallest acts of bravery that help build the bravery muscles that make those big moments possible. Yes, it may start with shrugging off that typo, but it ends with a bravery revolution, with generations of women and girls liberated, choosing to be brave, not perfect. This article is just totally stupid. And I see idiots like this and I'm like, you know, I could do this and make a ton of money, but I don't want to because you know what? I want to be authentic like she talked about and not be some stupid grifter 
who makes their money off of marketing a bunch of lies to women to tell them that it's the patriarchy and their parents and society who made them worry about this typo to the point that they can't get through the day. Like, no, I'm sorry. There's probably some ways that your parents parented you that interacted with your personality and created neuroses and there are solutions for that. But the solution is not to be like putting a typo in an email on purpose is a radical act of feminism. Like this is not helping anyone. This is not going to help anyone leave their job to start a company. This is not going to help a woman negotiate for herself for better compensation. I don't think there's always a difference in the internal experience of men and women. I think there's a difference in how they deal with it. Like men might get nervous or shy or scared or frustrated by failure, but they will find a way to push through it. But again, like I said, is that actually what's happening? Like it's something that men are better at? Maybe it is, but how much of it, at least in the modern era, is because women are often deciding to go into fields that they wouldn't naturally be interested in, whereas men tend to go into the fields that they're naturally interested in. They don't tend to be like, well, this ideology is telling me I should go be a nurse, even though I don't really want to do that. They're just like, yeah, I like computers. I'm going to go find a job with computers. I like math. I'm going to go do that. Whatever. Men just follow their passions and interests. Some men have one particular interest and they follow that. Some men just kind of bounce around and do whatever. So tell women to follow their interests. And if they're really passionate about it, then suck it up and deal with it when you get a B or someone criticizes you. Like doing this YouTube channel, I have to open myself up to public scrutiny, criticism, and I'm willing to do it because I'm passionate about this YouTube channel. I'm passionate about sharing my thoughts and making people feel less alone. I love doing this. If I didn't love doing this, then opening myself up to not only the feedback of others, but the constant scrutiny and perfectionistic lens that I place on my own work. If I wasn't passionate about this, it wouldn't be worth it. So all I can say to women is do what you want. Do what you're passionate about. And I don't mean passionate about like something that you're just interested in, something that you like. I mean something that you find meaning in, something that you find purpose in. And that may not be what you get paid for. Not everyone gets to get paid for that. But find something that you're passionate about, whether it's being a mom or some kind of volunteer work or a passion project. And I think that you'll find that it's a lot easier to deal with perfectionistic tendencies and worries about failure and critique because it's just too important to you. I will welcome feedback from any women watching on their personal take and experiences and obviously any men and the way that they've seen this play out for women that they've known. I read all of them even though sometimes YouTube deletes them before I can reply. So if people would be interested, maybe at some point I could make a Discord server. So if anyone's interested in that, you can let me know. But otherwise, I'm gonna wrap this rant here. Thank you for watching. I know that kind of meandered everywhere. If you like such meandering rants, please give this video a like. If you would like to see more such meandering rants, please subscribe and I will have more content for you very soon.